Hallelujah. The song says, bless that wonderful name, the name of Jesus. There's no other name I know. <laughs> oh, bless his name, the name of Jesus. Certainly, we welcome you here to your divine appointment, which is the media ministry of the Divine Jackson Divinity Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson. This class is Thursday school, Sunday school on Thursday. We're three days early so we can be ready for Sunday. We thank you for joining us. Here we are the first Sunday of March, March the 3rd, 2024. And we're continuing our study on faith. We've been on faith since the end of last year. Uh, and our subject on today is sustaining our faith. And we're in the exciting book of Jude. Amen. We don't have to say the chapter because there's only one. But we're going to be turning some pages in our Bible today. So I hope you have your Bible so you can turn with us. And if you're driving or you're working out, uh, you can always go back and look and look up those verses at a later time. But we bless God for this privilege to study together. Thank you for joining us. We want you to know these recordings are available on our social media platforms 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And will you kindly tell at least two people this week about Thursday School? Help us get the word out. We would appreciate that. Now, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word and for my brothers, sisters, and friends that have joined for this wonderful study. Have your way in us that we can live pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name and amen. Well, the word of God, I will be reading in the English Standard Version. We're in the book of Jude. And our lesson is verses 17 through 25. But we're going to begin actually at verse 15, two verses above there, because that lays such a beautiful foundation for where the lesson begins at verse 17. And so verse 15 says, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Look closely, if you will, with me at this verse. There are four key words that are going to help us when we get to our lesson. The word judgment, the word deeds, the word way, and the word spoken. If you want to mark those in your Bible or what have you, judgment deeds, way, and spoken. This is vital because, first of all, it establishes judgment is real. A lot of people don't believe it, but judgment is real. All sin, number two, must be judged. That's a universal principle. All sin, it must be judged. People say so-and-so's getting away with this, getting away. Nobody gets away with anything. All sin is judged. Now, how God deals with it is according to how we deal with it. Those sins that we do not uh, uh, confess and make Christ our Lord and Savior, and so that the death, the eternal penalty for our sin rolls onto him. If we don't do that, then we have to bear our sin, not only the consequences of earth, but the eternal consequences in the world to come. For the believer who casts Amen. Their burden of sin on the Savior, their eternal burden of sin is gone away. Sometimes there are some earthly consequences because consequences of sin, let's say that someone, um, they robbed a bank, they've been convicted, they're sitting in jail. Well, they may not get out of jail because they gave the heart to Christ. They may still have to serve their sentence. So there's an earthly consequence. Oh, Oh, Lord. But the eternal consequence is gone because whether you're sitting behind bars in a, in a hospital bed, no matter where you are, if you have made Christ Savior, the eternal record on you is clean. The blood has washed that clean. So whether we're on the inside or the outside, eternally, salvation is salvation. But sometimes there are earthly consequences of the things we've done. Amen. So we need to be careful about what we do because actions have consequences. They can have good consequences or they can have those that are very much uh, evil consequence. And so we need to choose carefully. Amen. Uh, even while we're unsaved, we need to make wise decisions. But certainly when we come to Christ, we want to do the thing that is upright and pleasing in God's sight. Glory to God. This principle all uh, uh, 
Sin must be just. I heard it sitting in a funeral well over 20 years ago. It still rings in my mind. And I want to encourage all of you. And if you know someone who ministers in funerals, encourage them. Even though it's a delicate time, people say, don't talk about sin and don't talk about eternity. And people are hurting and they're grieving. They have the loss of their loved one. But darlings, we have to lovingly, hallelujah, lovingly tell people the truth. Because all of us will go the way of the grave unless we're alive and remain caught up in the rapture. We're all going the way of the grave. Hallelujah. We need to prepare for that appointment. And so some people fail to tell the truth and they tell people something that's not true. Here's something that's another universal principle. Just like all sin will be judged, here's another universal principle. Lies never heal. The truth, even though it may be painful at the moment, truth is what heals. Lies put a band-aid on cancer. Truth heals. Glory to God. So we lovingly and respectfully and gently, but we must tell the truth. Glory to God. The truth is the thing that heals. We don't want people just to feel better. We want them to be better. Glory to God. And when we have vital information and withhold it, and someone suffers as a result of it, they lose their life as a result of it. Sometimes in a court of law, that person is found guilty of manslaughter, which is a form of murder because they had what was needed and withheld it from the person who was in jeopardy. We must not withhold the truth that all sin, it must be judged. Glory to God. We have to capture the open door and the opportunities that come into our lives to share truth lovingly. Because if we were on our way to eternal damnation, we'd want somebody to tell us. Amen. Behold the love of Christ. It's God's love that caused him to send his son into the world. So we must not fail to warn the person in danger. Amen. Always tell the truth. Amen. Including the truth about sin. Glory to God. This verse talks about judgment. Judgment is real. Number two, it talks about the ungodly will be dealt with about their deeds. That's what they've done. They'll also be dealt with, we'll look at the last one, about things spoken, what they said. So the deeds that they did and the words are spoken. The Bible says every idle word we will give an account in judgment. That's the Bible. Every idle word. So what we do and what we say. But here's the one we want to highlight. It talks about an ungodly way in which they committed their sin. Not only what they did, but the way they did. Wow, that's heavy because it speaks to the fact that God knows the heart, which is where the motives are. Not just what you did, but how you did it and why. What was behind it? God knows the motives. Well, let's look at the scripture to find background. Let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 12 and verse 47. I'm reading here in the New King James Version, New King James Version, Luke 12 and 47. It says, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Oh, Lord, our judgment is according to our heart and what we knew. And that's why you and I are not the judge because we don't know. God, he knows. Amen. Looking at the matter of the heart, look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. This is when Samuel, of course, is down at the house of Jesse and they're preparing to anoint the king. 1 Samuel 16, 7, New King James Version. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Wow. Not just what was done, but the way it was done. Let's turn over to James chapter 4 and verse 17. James 4 and 17. It says, James 4 and 17 tells us that he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him, it is sin. Wow, wow, wow. Word of the Lord is speaking to us today. Amen. Glory to God. Going back to our lesson. Glory to God. Looking at verse uh, 16. Verse, we know the lesson begins at 17. But verse 16, let me read it to you. It says here in the ESV, These are grumblers 
malcontents, those that are discontented. They're following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. <clears throat> the reason we needed to look at these two verses, it describes the wickedness and the things that are going on. Because as we now enter into our lesson, it's telling us how to live considering the kind of world we're living in. Oh, glory to God. Oh, bless his name. We need to be sustained. Hallelujah. In our faith. That's the, that's the subject, sustaining our faith. Look at verse 17 here in the ESV. It says, but you, and we're going to see that word again, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the apostles said. They've told us about this. What did they say? Look at verse 18. They said to you that in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. And the verses we read above break down the, 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 the nature and the character and the spirit of the day. And that God is going to judge it all. Oh my God. Glory to God. Now we come into verse 19. It says, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people that are devoid of the spirit, talking about the spirit of God. Now you and I, he's about to talk about us. When he says you, talking about we as believer, we are to be led by the spirit of God. Whereas the world does not have the spirit. And in the book of St. John chapter 16, it says, speaking of the Holy Ghost, it says whom the world cannot receive. You can't receive the spirit of God if you haven't received Christ as savior. But all of us that have received Christ as savior, we receive the spirit of God. And because we have the spirit of God working in us, we live a different life. We are totally different than that list and description we had above. Amen. Look at verse 20. Now, starting at verse 20, there are eight things that you and I as believers are to do. Are you ready? Do you have your pen ready to mark these? There's eight things. And these eight points are our assignment, our eight point assignment. Let's look, let's just name them. In verse 20, number one, we're to be building. And that same verse later on, we're to be praying. Look at verse 23. We are to be, uh, excuse me, darling, one, two, got my numbers here. Uh, number three, we're supposed to be uh, keeping. So at the beginning of verse 23, we're keeping. And then number four in that same verse, we're waiting. And then in verse 22, we are to have mercy. And then in verse 23, we're to save. And later in that same verse, we're to show mercy. And then also in that same verse, as it concludes, it says that we're hating. These are all verbs, they're action words. We're building, praying, keeping, waiting, having mercy, saving, showing mercy, and hating. That's our eight point assignment. And that is our Bible Spotlight. Oh, glory to God. Let's look at our eight-point assignment. Are we ready? All of us want to fulfill our assignment. Amen. Here we go. He starts out there in verse 20. Glory to God saying, but you, we're the believer, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Well, that's our first part. How do you build yourself up in faith? The scripture says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Here we are today studying the word of God. It's the study of it. It's the meditation on the word, thinking on it. It's putting it into action. Those things build our faith. So there's not just head knowledge, but our soul comes to know the reality of what we've read as we live it and we see it come to pass. We pray the word of God. All of these things, studying the word of God, meditating, living it, praying it, builds us up in our most holy faith. And number two, it says praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, this is a twofold. On the one aspect, 
we have 1 Corinthians. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2 and also verse 4. 1 Corinthians 14. Because there's two aspects as part about praying in the spirit. There's one aspect which has to do with uh, praying in an unknown tongue. And we dealt with that or unknown language. Uh, the uh, If we look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. The scripture uh, opens there. If you turn there, 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. The apostle says, Though I speak with the tongues, talking about languages, of men and of angels. There are languages that are unknown to the earth. It's not German, it's not Japanese, it's not Chinese, it's not English, it's not French. Those are languages of men. But there are heavenly languages, which are the languages, so to speak, of the angels. Sometimes the Lord will allow us to speak in languages that are in the spirit realm, languages that are not of her. And we'll talk about that in chapter 14. Are you with me? So 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 establishes that there are languages of men and of angels. And now in 1 Corinthians 14, looking at verse 2 and verse 4. Verse 2 says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Uh, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. And then it goes on to say the one that prophesies is edifying or building the whole body. Whereas the one that's speaking in tongues is building themselves. It goes on to verse 14. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And he's describing here about uh, tongues or languages and how it's to be handled in the uh, congregation. That's a whole discussion that we've had at a previous time. The only principle here is that this verse in Jude, when it talks about praying in the Holy Spirit, on the one aspect, it can have to do with those that are praying in an unknown tongue under the unction of the Spirit of God. Amen. Some believe that tongues are for this age and some believe that it's not but it's here in the word of God. Now, the other aspect of this verse here in Jude, when it's talking about praying in the spirit, the other aspect has to do with that we're praying according to God's will, not praying out of the spirit of man, of what we want and our will, but praying according to the spirit of God, what is his will and what he wants done. Amen. Self versus the spirit. So that's the other aspect of this verse. Well, let's look at a couple of verses pertaining thereunto. Let's look at 1 John. Uh, let's look at St. John chapter 15 and verse 7. St. John 15 and 7. And it lets us know, it's talking about you are the, uh, I am the vine and you're the branches and so on. And he that um, uh, doesn't abide in me, you know, without me, you can do nothing. But look at verse 7 in chapter 15. And I thought I had that one marked. My apologies. St. John 15 and verse 7. It says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will or you will ask what you desire and it will be done to you. But this is the person who's abiding, living in Christ, connected to him, yielded to him growing in him, obeying him, right? In that kind of a setting, you abide in me and my word is living in you, not visiting, but it lives there <laughs> freely and fully. You ask what you will and you'll, have a and you'll have that desire. So this kind of praying is praying out of our relationship that is growing and flourishing with Christ because he's the vine and we're the branches. All right. Then we go on to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, also in the New King James Version. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask, this is prayer, anything according to his will, he hears us. And then 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. But all of this is if we ask anything that's according to his will. Amen. So this is, again, praying according to the spirit of God as, as opposed to praying according to the spirit of self. When we pray according to the spirit of God, it's always in his will. 
Now, here's a verse that breaks it down for us even more. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Romans 8, 26 and 27. I'm in the New King James Version. Likewise, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Look at 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit, knows what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And here, as we look at the passage, there's three, uh, three people involved. There's us, there's the Father, and there's the Holy Spirit. Well, it starts out saying we, we don't, you know, the Spirit of God is helping our infirmities because, you know, we need help. <laughs> and uh, we don't know how we should pray as we are. And it goes on to talk about what the Spirit does. So essentially, we have three pieces here. There's us who's praying, but our prayers are not yet perfected because our understanding of the will of God is not yet perfected because our understanding of God is not yet perfected. So our prayers are short of perfection. Then part two, the one who knows the mind of the spirit, the father knows the mind of the spirit. Of course he does, that's his spirit. So the father, he knows what the mind of the spirit is. And the third party, the spirit, what does he do? The spirit of God prays on our behalf according to the will of God. And he doesn't miss because he knows exactly the will of God. So we're praying our imperfected, incomplete prayers. God the Father knows our heart, what we desire and where we are and where we're trying to get to. He knows the motive behind the prayer. But the Spirit of God intervenes on our behalf and prays perfectly. <laughs> The will of God. Isn't that something beautiful? Somebody help me shout glory. And so all of this is prayer according to the spirit. Amen. So the tongues part, praying in the spirit. And then all of these verses having to do with praying according to the spirit. What's according to the spirit? According to the will of God. Because St. John 15 talking about, the St. John 15 talking about, our connection and the word of God being free in us, right? So we can ask, in other words, pray, and we receive it. First John chapter five, breaking it down, that we'll always receive if we're praying according to the will of God. And then here, Romans eight, breaking it down, that sometimes we don't quite know the will, but we got the spirit to go on our behalf who always prays it just right, intercedes on our behalf. Isn't this something marvelous? So prayer in the spirit, glory to God, both aspects of it, amen. Now, verse uh, 21, now we're down to key. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Love is the key. Love is the principle. Love is what sent Jesus to her. Love is what called him to die. We are to walk in the love of God. Look at the fruit of the spirit of the God. The first one, the key one, it's love. Then we look over there in Peter when it talks about uh, in chapter one, how God has given us great and precious promises that we add to our faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and temper, and to all these stages, the highest level, it's love. So the maximum maturity is walking in the perfect love of God. The fruit of the Spirit, the key fruit, it's the love of God. Love, the Bible says, is the fulfilling of the law. Keep yourselves in love. A lot of things come up to try to get us to operate outside of love, but the Bible says, Keep yourself in the love of God. Number four, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to see some things about mercy a couple of times, but this one is waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. We are to wait for that ultimate uh, entry into the heavens where we're with the Lord. Jesus said in, in uh, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there I may be also. Wait, hallelujah, on that ultimate fulfillment of his mercy. He's already shown his mercy. But the ultimate fulfillment of mercy, when we go to be with the Lord. Oh, glory to God. Wait for it. Tell somebody, wait for it. Glory to God. And that 
waiting for that mercy that leads to eternal life. Amen. And again, we receive mercy already with salvation, received his mercy every day. His mercy is new every day, like the dew on the ground. All that mercy, 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 mercy. But that also with mercy, in terms of eternal life, the fulfillment, the culmination of that is when we go to be with the Lord. Glory to God. Then look at verse uh, 22, back to mercy again, because three times mercy is in here. And this one, it says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Well, the first one, we're waiting on the ultimate expression of God's mercy toward us. And meanwhile, we be merciful to others. <laughs> Everybody who doubts, and some of that could be unbelievers or believers who have not grown in their faith yet. Be merciful to people. The ultimate mercy to the lost is to tell them about Christ and be an example and show them love and kindness. And your brothers and sisters that are coming along, they're still growing, they haven't reached your level of maturity. Be merciful with them. Oh, help me shout mercy. Glory to God. That was number five. Number six in verse 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. Now that's evangelism. Go snatch somebody out of the fires of hell by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Snatch them out of the fire of hell. And here, here's the third time. It's number seven. Show mercy. We're back to mercy again. Show mercy ah, with fear. And this has to do with a humility, right? Consider yourself. Bible even told us there in Matthew chapter five, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Show mercy with a humble heart. Hallelujah. Considering others. Mercy, precious saints, be merciful. And then number eight, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. We're to hate sin. Look at all these other things. Show mercy, show mercy, show mercy. Keep yourself in the love of God and pray and all the, and at the end, hate sin. <laughs> hate sin. Look at the doxology. Here's the great closing. Now unto him, I'm reading of course in the ESV. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Isn't that beautiful? But we got to be willing to be kept. He's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless. This is important, Doctor, because some people say we cannot live a holy life. But the Bible's commanded, be ye holy for I'm holy. So the Lord is calling us to let the Spirit perfect us and work in through us. Now, the Bible said grow in grace. Well, we didn't, which means we didn't master it from the beginning, but we need to be growing in it. Amen. We're not to celebrate sin. We're to reject sin. Glory to God, because God said for us to live a holy life. Amen. Bible says when we come to Christ with the sincere milk of the word, but you don't stay on milk forever, you grow up into me. So it's a process of growth and development. Bible says we're his workmanship. He's working on us. All those things talk about progress and development. Amen. We don't stay like we were. We're on our way to growth and maturity in the Lord. Lord, take us there. Now to him who's able to keep you, he is. Yes, he is to keep you from falling. Amen. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Talking about the great celebration in it, where we're, where we're presented almost like a trophy to the love and the grace of God. Amen. Look at verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what did God the Father do? So God the Father is going to do something. But he did it through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God saves us through his Son. Oh, glory to God. Jesus says, no man come to the Father but by me. St. John 14, 6. Amen. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man come to the Father but by me. So to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, what do we give? Glory, majesty, dominion, authority, before all time, which was the past, now, which is the present, and forever, which is the future. Amen and amen. If you've not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, receive him now as your Lord and Savior. Just admit, Lord, I've sinned and I know I have. I should have forgiven me. Wash me, cleanse me, turn me around, make me new. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I believe not only did he die, but he rose again and he's alive. I accept Jesus as my Lord and I'm following him. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Join the Bible, believe preaching and teaching church. Serve the Lord. Glory to God, and we'll see you in heaven. God bless you. Remember this, my brothers and sisters and friends, the God of the Bible is real. Prepare for your divine appointment with him because it's coming. God bless you till we meet again.